Hello there and welcome to the Zoom Indusol webinar. Uh, I'm Jack Hannam. I'm the current president of the British Society of Soil Science and I'm delighted to welcome you to our third webinar of the year. Um, before I move on to welcome our presenters, I'd just like to introduce the British Society of Soil Science as we are hosters for today's webinar. Uh, we're an international membership organisation and charity uh, committed to the study of soil in its widest aspects and we bring together those working in academia and we have a growing membership amongst practitioners implementing soil science in industry and business and we're also interested to hear from members who have a keen interest in soils generally. Um, we're planning to host uh, 10 webinars during 2024 with loads of different sort of hot topics. So please do keep an eye on our website for further details to check what's coming up in future months. Um, and just before we begin, just a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, there's lots of you here on the call today. So all your microphones have been muted. Um, We'll be taking questions at the end of both presentations and we'll be monitoring those questions uh, throughout the webinar. So if anything springs to mind, please do submit your questions uh, in the questions tab and please make sure you do that by about 10 to 1. And that will allow us to go through as many questions as we can uh, at the end of the webinar for both of our presenters. Uh, there is a raise your hand button. We won't actually be using that uh, during the webinar unless the presenter specifically asks for a show of hands. And just to remind everybody, today's um, presentation has been awarded CPD points, so both BASIS and NRSO. And if you're registered with either of those bodies, please contact us directly at the Society after the event to claim your CPD points. And I'm um, sure I don't need to remind you, but finally, just do be aware that we are recording this webinar. So if you want to listen back or play back some of the, the presentations, it will be available on the BSQ YouTube channel afterwards. So enough of the housekeeping. Um, I'd like to move on to introduce our first presenter, and that is Sarah George. And Sarah is an ecologist and a safari guide at the NEP rewilding project down in Sussex. And she's also a member of the British Society of Soil Science Outreach Committee. Uh, she has degrees in countryside management and ecology and a um, research master's in ecology where she focused on soils. Great to hear. <laughs> uh, she's got a lifelong love of horses and has worked with them in traditional conservation, grazing and in real rewilding setups, and has also worked with lots of other livestock. And as such, this makes her involvement at NEP much about the, the large herbivores that they had there and their impact on the soils and of course the sort of vegetation between. Uh, Sarah also lectures and writes land management courses at school, college and university levels and is involved in assessing land and wildlife qualifications for a UK examining board. So I'm really delighted to welcome Sarah and I'm really excited to hear about all of the, the things you're, that you're doing at NEP and I'm sure everybody else is here on the call. So I'll shut up now and hand over to you. So over to you, Sarah. Thanks very much. And I can see your presentations come up. That's perfect. Thank you. Two. That's lovely. I'm I'm unmuted, and I will just sorry. I just there we are. So hopefully everybody can see my presentation. Thank you for such a lovely introduction, Jack. That was really lovely. Um, and now you know who I am. Let's let's move on with with having a look at um, net rewilding and really interestingly how it impacts with the soils as you've just heard my involvement is very much about the herbivores but actually the interaction between them and the soils um, is starting to be more and more recognized as a really effective and swift way of restoring soils 
But ironically, in the rewilding project at NEP, um, it was actually one of the elements that was least regarded or considered when, when the project started. However, that is changing. So to give you a little bit of background about NEP, if you're not familiar with it, it's roughly halfway between London and Brighton um, and sits in an area of the country known as the Low Weald. And if that area is famous for anything, it probably is its clay. And NEP sits on about 300 metres of it. And in terms of soil grading um, between one and five, with one being the best, as you know, it's most of it graded at three, predominantly three B, so very, very poor soil. What I find often um, gives visitors uh, an understanding of what that means is to take them back several hundred years before NEP and before the rewilding project and remind them that this is an area originally famous for its brick production and its tile production um, because the clay there was very capable of making these waterproof solid items. And you can see that understanding suddenly going into place. So the very origins of, of the net rewilding project, as we see at the moment, um, actually could be taken back to this post-war environment. Now, this is a picture of the estate um, at that time. The, pic the map that you've just seen, seen shows that the estate is divided into three, and this is the, the castle, the residential area section in the middle. And this is a grassed area that post-war was ploughed and put to seed. And as we know, um, our country, many countries across Europe, their, their populations were, were starving. We needed food and we need it urgently. And if there was any chance of land being able to produce food, it was put to work. And this is exactly what happened at NEP. Now, there's a whole other conversation about where that went on, coming into our common agricultural policy. But essentially, where farming went on was that if land could be farmed for food, that was what should happen. And NEP itself over that time developed into a dairy farm um, along with associated arable. Now, uh, the Bowles, Charlie Bowell, the, the, the current custodian, um, he took over the farm in the 1980s and at that point he was fresh out of the R Royal Agricultural U University. All sorts of ideas about how he could make the farm profitable and he could work whereas his grandparents hadn't. More machinery, more, more pesticides, more fertilizers and he spent 20 years trying to get this land to be productive only three of which were actually financially successful. And they found themselves in 2000 in a position where the, the farm needed a seven figure input just to remain moving forward. And over this time, their, their love of the land of the estate had introduced them to various people like Ted Green, a famous veteran tree ecologist, Franz Vera, the Dutch ecologist associated with um, Oost van der Plassen, over in Holland. And these experiences decided, put them in a position where they decided they would take the land out of production and would look at generating a more process led natural regeneration. Um, their phrase is literally taking their hands off the steering wheel and letting nature choose the direction. Now, before they did this, they were working with a lot of experts, taking expert opinion, and a lot of baselines were put in place for various data. However, none on soil. It's literally, um, it was taken for granted. It was there doing its thing. Now, these are the kind of things that we are seeing now, and these are resulting from, the phrase out of production literally means what it says. Um, the different fields produced different quantities and the worst fields ceased to be farmed first. Um, the best fields were, their crops were taken out in 2005, 2006 and they were left. And over that time, any fencing on the estate was removed, land drains were removed to try and restore this natural uh, ecology. Now, what it means, um, 
is that there's a lot of wet woodland. The area is a lot wetter than it used to be, which is ironic because it actually now manages um, extreme wet weather events better. But we've got this phrased out lags down at the bottom. The farm is crisscrossed by small streams. Um, and that's the, the word lag is, is a Sussex word for that. But because that land was so wet, um, the, the areas to either side of the stream were actually never ploughed and never planted. So essentially there's potentially some quite historic grasslands there. The land was no longer um, had pesticides or fertilizers put on it, but also the animals that were sub introduced three or four years later, they weren't wormed. Um, so that has no ivermectins on it and that's had a, a huge impact. Things like hedgerows, um, they cannot be taken out of production, but um, the family ceased flailing them and they've now been allowed to flourish and, and flounce, I'm told the technical term is, um, and creating this really lovely structural habitat. Ancient trees have flourished and of course the animals are putting dung um, all over the estate. Okay. This really is, is, you know, soil is becoming very much part of the, the rewilding movement. And I figured a really good place to start talking about the soil here, um, particularly the clay soils and talking about how poor they were, was to actually start looking at air, an area, which I always find a little bit embarrassing. This is just as you come onto the estate proper. And it's an area of really nice soil. Now, I apologise for the poorly focused picture of a cow and her calf on the right, but I wanted to start here because for me, it sums up that connection between the herbivores that we have on site and how they work with the soils. This area of really nice soil on the left, I, I took the picture recently and you can just see the nettles starting to come through. Now, as we know, they're uh, an indicator plant of rich, nutrient rich soils. And actually, what we've observed on the estate is if the cows calve naturally um, out in the fields, what they will do is they will tuck their calf into a hedgerow and they will actually seek out these areas and they will eat the, the vegetation, such as the nettles. They're really mineral rich, they're full of nutrients and they actually are restoring that cow's energy after she's given birth and giving her the energy to go ahead and look after her new calf um, in, in the weeks and months ahead. So it creates this really lovely circular connection between the health of the soils and the health of the animals. Now from one absolutely excellent soil, let me take you back to the beginning. This, these are photos of NEP. Um, the photo on the right is where the stalks currently can be seen. And these are our fields as they were at that time. We can see the ploughing taking place. Um, so destroying that soil biodiversity, potentially drying them out, um, potentially making them vulnerable to erosion. And of course, at this point, pesticides were being used, fertilizers being used to increase the crop production, however, inadvertently decreasing biodiversity. And of course, then the ecosystem and the ecosystem services um, that supports that. So take a snapshot of this in your mind for our next slide starts here, but shows you what 17 to 18 years difference of just leaving the land can make. And if I just can put that through again, look at the oak tree on the background to give yourself a reference point. It is the same field. Now, this is what happens when we allow the animals free, free grazing will, okay? They can roam at will. Um, the stocking rate is roughly half to two thirds um, per hectare. And what this means is that they can browse and graze the, the plants, but never to destruction. So there's small amounts of damage that generate um, growth in the plant, increase competition, let light through. And 
obviously with this permanent soil cover that's um, reducing soil erosion because the soil's covered but there's also a strong root system just holding it together what has actually been seen um, is that since the beginning we've had studies done by Queen Mary University of London and for every three meters of bare soil that the project started off with one is now covered in scrub what that doesn't account for that's a very um, two-dimensional measurement is the height of the scrub and the mosaic of different types of plants heights of plants age of plants and that's really important to the animal health and to the soil health the other thing that is worth bearing in mind is we focus on scrub because it's that stage of vegetational succession between farmland and woodland, um, the two areas that were focused on post-war. But also we need to remember that there's lots of plants here, thistles, ragworts, flea bones, which traditionally are seen as the, the enemy of the grower. However, what they're actually doing for this land, these soils, is they're very deep rooted and they're bringing through minerals and nutrients up to the surface. Um, and the phrase is healing the soil. It's a really nice thought that the plants that grow are rectifying and bringing things back into a level that they should be. So to give you an idea of the animals that you will find at NEP, um, these are known as the, the NEP Big Five. We have our Longhorn cattle, our Tamworth pigs, our red deer, our Exmoor ponies and our fallow deer. And these essentially are here as proxies for animals that would have been in the landscape at the end of the last interglacial. And the reason for this is we're very much taught that um, our land is farmland or woodland and that um, prior to us farming it, our nation was covered in woodland and that a squirrel could have jumped from John O'Groats down to Land's End without putting its little paws on the ground. Now, actually, the work of Franz Vera, um, the work of Oliver Rackham suggested that this just couldn't have been the case because the fossil record tells us that the animals that were in the landscape at that time um, and the dentition tells us they were herbivores and they were large. So they would have needed space to move around and then actually we probably had an a more open wood pasture landscape. So where those animals have become extinct, these are their descendants and work in the same way that they would have um, and each has different morphologies in times of body size, hoof size, width of shoulders, antlers or horns, even down to the way that they browse the vegetation, graze the grasses and the way their digestive systems process that um, and deposit it on the ground. What that actually means is that um, we have opportunity for many, many invertebrates to thrive that just can't in more managed environments. And a really good example of that is the lesser earwig, um, which very fussily will only live on the mycelium of pony dung. Um, we have found it at NEP, but that obviously isn't a particularly common um, thing to find. Now, I bring you to this slide because what I've talked about is all of the animals grazing and browsing the vegetation, but there is one in there, and we talk about the herbivores, there is one in there that is the exception, and it is our Tamworth pigs. And from a soil point of view, these are the heavy movers, quite literally. When I always feel with them, when we talk about rewilding or natural regeneration, the pigs are the rebit. They are the bit that introduces bare soil. Their rootling is literally, they are putting their snouts in the ground, pushing them along about 10 centimetres down. Um, and Isabella Tree refers to it as unzipping, but it literally looks like that, turning over bare soil. And that's where your next generation of plants can germinate. It's literally, they create a, a, little, a, a little cell, 10 centimetres down, protected from air movement, air temperature, generally a little bit more moist, and they are perfect protected environments for that regeneration. 
we've even been able to link this. We were talking about um, birds and bird spotters, but we've actually been able to link this to the supporting some of the rare species on site, such as the turtle dove, who thrive on that natural regen regeneration. The picture on the right, um, if any of you fancy vis visiting us, is a picture of one of the main footpaths through. You can see how the work the pigs have done there. The picture on the top left actually started out as a pig nest and they're manipulating the soil and making beds in it. They are warm in the winter and then the soil is cooler in the summer. So they're really using the thermal properties but effectively in recent weather, what they've done is created an ephemeral pool. It's another whole range of habitats, absolutely awesome. Now with all of these animals roaming the entire estate, their dung being deposited full of digested vegetation in different stages, seeds, one of the things that is really essential to actually introducing that um, dung in, into the ground is our population of dung beetles. Now we've recorded over 1800 invertebrate species at NEP and 21 species of dung beetle. This particular picture on the right is a violet door beetle um, and we had the first recording of that in Sussex for, for I believe about 50 years last year. Okay. Now, dung beetles are an absolutely essential role, as I'm, as I'm sure you're all aware. But one of the things that has been observed is that the soil restoration um, in rewilding projects is actually a lot quicker than it is in many organic projects. And one of the things that has come out of this is the fact that our animals are out year round. So for the dung beetles, they actually have a year round source of dung to, to be working with. Whereas in many organic projects, they might not be using the ivermectins um, that are causing them, but they are still taking their animals off the land over winter and over renting them in sheds, which of course is removing the dung at that time. And that brings us to worms, um, which again, are another excellent indicator for soil health. Now, when the project started, we were advised um, that it would probably take 100 years for them to move out of the hedgerows and move into the middle of fields. It actually took about 10 years um, for anisic worms to be observed in the center of fields. Now, this is put down not just to stopping using pesticides um, and stopping plowing, which of course was, was not helping them, but actually really interestingly, um, because where the uh, scrub was growing up, it was depositing leaf litter onto the ground. And this was actually creating connectivity for the worms. They were actually able to access that, that central area more safely. Um, I just find that concept of worms and connectivity, it's a, a, something we talk about a lot in conservation, but very rarely at invertebrate level. And I really like the fact that we're now starting to consider that. It's probably worthwhile mentioning as well that in 2013, um, we had a master's student from Imperial um, do a study on worms compared to a very friendly neighboring farm who lets us study their soils. And they found a significant um, large, larger number of, of worms in our soils and 19 different species. Another way we can see the health of the soils on NEP is to actually look at our trees. And these are all NEP trees, very much a before and after. And we can see that the tree sort of on the top left is very staggy, um, where the branches are sticking out, where the tree is actually retren retrenching its growth closer to its trunk as, as it becomes harder and harder for it to gain nutrients and water. Now, what has been observed is that since the fields were taken out of production, the tree health has improved. And this is because essentially the mycorrhizae, the mycorrhizal networks have been able to reestablish. They are no longer being broken up by the plow. And a lot of the trees now, rather than having this staggy re 
trenching approach actually have what is called the broccoli effect where they are looking really healthy and the mycorrhizae it just means that by being able to reconnect um, it's expanding the root system of those trees they can gain more water which they need in our, our current um, climatic drought situations over summer they can gain more nutrients and there is a visible difference in in the health of the tree Now, bearing in mind that um, what we are seeing is perhaps a stronger root element, a stronger mycorrhizal um, element within the soils. In December 22, we had uh, studies done by a company called AgriCarbon to look at the soil carbon within, within net plant. And again, they compared this to, to our friendly neighbours. Now, they actually were so surprised um, at the results that they went off and checked them and double checked them. But they found that the rewilded soil could absorb up to 4.8 tonnes more carbon, carbon dioxide per hectare per year than those in the neighbouring soil in the neighbouring land. That obviously, um, in talking about sequestering carbon, that has some real, real potential. This sits on the back of studies done by Cranfield, um, where a soil organic carbon has been seen to double over time. Soil microbial biomass has been seen to double. We have seen an increase in fungal biomarkers. And generally just this, this soil health um, slowly improving. Again, we didn't have the baselines, so it's hard to quantify, but I think this is something that really is starting to become of interest now, particularly um, thinking about carbon credits and such like. And to our knowledge, the farm soil carbon code is currently being developed, and we're really keen to see the place for rewilding within that. Now, the original idea for this um, for this talk came about when we were talking about water storage and how soils are, are dealing with with recent heavy rains and bearing in mind that this soil is clay um, and it's low wield. So when it rains, it floods and it is an area that is very much prone to that. And there's been various bits happening here. The picture on the left, if you can just about make out, there's a large sort of lake in the middle, but if you look um, around the left-hand side and the bottom, you will see a, a rig, a wiggly river. I found that quite hard to say. That is the realigned River Ada, which was canalised to try and drain it um, and improve the, the water movement out of the soil. However, um, what, what we wanted to happen was that actually rather than that happening with funding from Natural England and the NEPA state in 2011 the, the canalised bit was refilled and the meanders were put back in and what has actually happened is that that's been seen to really reduce the amount of soil flowing the, the meanders literally trap the silt in the bends as it's going down and this has really rebalanced the river but it's also reconnected it to floodplains. Um, so now this area, rather than the water rushing through and taking the soil with it, it's a much slower water movement. This has been supported by um, volunteers putting a whole bunch of woody debris in. So again, these actors is what they call leaky dams, um, and they're all about trapping that, that silt and stopping it from just whooshing out the other end as it comes off, off the estate. The picture on the right is one of the lags as it goes across, and you can see that it is a very straight stream. And again, the area on either side is, is nice grassland, but is very, very wet but we're looking to see how the animals use these areas and they're becoming kind of puddled around the edges as, as the animals get in there, use them for water temperature over the summer, use them for nice lush grazing over the winter. So from talking about the rivers, um, 
one of the key elements on site, one of our key introductions has been beavers. And these ones were reintroduced in 2022. What I have attempted to do on the left is actually show you an image of the pen that they were re-released into. Now, you can see in the middle, there is a large pond there and they needed a small version of that because they feel safer. They need to be underwater. That's where they're at their, their most secure to move around. But this actually was a relatively small stream. If you're athletic, you probably could have leapt over it. And in the year between them being reintroduced and this image being taken, you can see how that pond has spread out. They made a huge difference to water movement through the area. Now, what that actually means in terms of improving the soil um, is that it has changed the soil structure. Um, that area now holds water much better. And although it's very easy to imagine the benefits of that in the summer when we have a drought, and you can see instantly um, the minute we, we do start to have drier weather, it's where the insects go, it's where the an other animals go because it is wetter and cooler. What you actually can see in the winter is that the water is held in this area and the outlet down at the bottom left um, remains at a fairly steady pace rather than the water rushing, rushing through. And again, this really improves the soil retention in this area. What is also noticeable is that if you walk in there, on the clay, you are glooping your way through all kinds of um, trudgy clay. It's a real workout for visitors. But actually in the beaver pen, yes, there's less traffic, but that soil is more able to take the weight of you, you moving over. And this is just, we have, um, webcam footage of the beavers working hard. That looks fascinating, Sarah. Um, just another minute or so left. Um, so we've got time for Olivia to do her presentation. Thank you. So this is, this is a picture of the pen. Well, I've included this because you can see the soil particles, the clay held in the water upstream of the dam. And A, it's really um, clever the way they build them, but also by having the water move through them, where that sediment is trapped, it actually increases the efficiency of the dam. And I will come past this also wanted to just show you some of the ponds. Now that particular film was where it was an area that flooded and we actually just got in there and made a pond. But the impact of the animals is that they puddle the bottom and they create an area that is really resilient and will hold the water in the winter, um, but also doesn't get damaged when it dries out during the summer. And finally, a little bit about um, connectivity again. We have a project showing on the bottom right, which is called Wheels to Waves, and it's about making a corridor for nature that starts off in the top of Sussex and Kent um, on the Ashdown Forest and comes all the way down through Sussex and out through a farm um, down at Climping at the bottom. Now, whilst this is for nature, all of the actions within this should be beneficial for soils. And it'll be really interesting to see um, how that data is, is recorded and observed over the time. I also wanted to just draw to your attention our podcasts. We have guests um, from organisations such as the Natural History Museum talking about the worms that are found on site. And also just to let you know really that we have a sister company called Natigal, um, which has been set up and they very much are looking at things like biodiversity credits, but also soil carbon credits to see how those markets are developing and how they might be used to help fund soil restoration, nature restoration, looking forwards. 
So I've put just a couple of links to the um, to the website and particularly to some of the surveys and the papers used in putting this together. Otherwise, I would like to say thank you for your time and I look forward to your questions. That's absolutely fantastic. Thanks. So, I mean, fascinating. I don't know how many facts I've taken from that. I think my favourite one is uh, the lesser earwigs diet of pony poo or the mycelium on the poo. So uh, I hadn't I had no idea about that before. But It's one of our um, favourites too. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it is. Um, we have lots of questions. So I, I just wanted to try and move on because to give you a chance to answer them at the end. So thanks to everybody that's posted those um, already. And thanks, Sarah. Um, we'll see you again uh, after the next uh, presentation. I'd like to welcome our next presenter, um, who is Olivia Azevedo, and she's a PhD student at the University of Stirling, and she's also at Forest Research, and she's also an early career member of the British Society of Soil Science. So welcome, Olivia. Delighted to have you as our second speaker. Um, she's exploring temperate forest interactions, so emphasising the influence of woodland creation on soil properties and nutrient cycling and ecosystem dynamics. Um, and her research is focused on the long term impacts of, of that sort of woodland establishment on things like soil structure and carbon distribution. Um, so I'm going to hand over to her. I'd, I'd like to hear all about her research, actually, rather than trying to describe it now. But um, be really fascinating to understand and see what the differences are between those sort of uh, rewilding products and the and the woodland creation work that you've been doing so if you're ready i'll hand over thanks very much i'm studying the long-term effects of woodland creation on uh, soil structure and the fate of carbon um next slide the slide please um next slide so, uh, so when talking uh, about my research, I like to go back to this photo uh, right at the start of fieldwork um, <clears throat> back in 2019. Um, fieldwork gave me the opportunity to collect samples, of course, but also to connect with the environment I was about to study and the people uh, that had a very close connection with the woodland I was uh, about to sample. Because ultimately, when we uh, talk about the efforts to create new woodlands, uh, there's a big human component. Um, farmers and landowners are enticed by the, the benefits of woodland creation for several reasons. Uh, first of all, uh, to generate extra income, but also to enhance their land and to increase uh, farm uh, productivity. Um, it is also an emotional act uh, because they have this vision of for the future and that is of woodland creation as a, a lasting legacy uh, that benefits present and future uh, generations. Next uh, slide, please. My uh, project aims, uh, the project uh, aims to study how soil aggregation changes over time in temperate forests, and it also seeks to understand this connection between aggregate stability and the storage of uh, soil organic carbon. Uh, these are my research questions. Uh, research question one, uh, next please. So what is the effect of woodland creation on soil carbon stocks and um, how does this vary uh, with forest age? Next, please. And how does uh, forest age influence water stable aggregates and carbon distribution within aggregates? Next, please. Uh, just to go back a little bit, um, I'm part of the, the RAIN project, and uh, this is a, a natural experiment uh, um, investigating the biodiversity in fragmented uh, landscapes in Scotland and uh, England, uh, they, uh, which are characterized by um, agricultural land. 
uh, the project, the RAIN project started in 2013 and involved the use of historical mapping uh, and field surveys to gather uh, information on woodland age, um, size, characteristics and surrounding habitat features uh, with a total of 106 secondary woodland sites plus 27 ancient uh, woodland sites. Uh, th th these were chosen for analysis, um, but the focus uh, on is on woodlands in arable and mixed agricultural land. To date, the RAND group have surveyed for um, vascular plants, uh, ground beetles, spiders, flying insects, uh, uh, many terrestrial mammals, uh, bats, birds, and also lower plants such as lichens and bryophytes. So when I joined the RAIN project in 2019, we added the soil element uh, to this project. Uh, next, please. So the, the sites used uh, in this study for this talk varied in size between uh, 0.5 and 5, just under 5 hectares in size. And, and are all located around central Scotland. The vegetation is pre uh, predominantly uh, mixed deciduous trees, um, and these sites were uh, planted on agricultural land. Uh, there's a total of 40 woodland sites of various ages, plus five pasture sites that serve as uh, mite control sites. Next, please. Uh, next, the woodland age uh, was split into different age categories. Uh, there's an initial stage of woodland creation uh, characterized by uh, an abundance of um, soil resources and open canopy. Next. Then there's the stem exclusion stage uh, characterized by um, competition and um, shade tolerant species. Next, please. We also can see uh, some poor uh, soil conditions developing at this stage. Next one. The understory reinitiation uh, is where there is an increase in uh, stand complexity, um, and also we can see uh, understory growth. Next, please. And finally, we have the old growth woodland uh, defined by autogenic and gap replacing processes. Um, there is natural mortality of large overstory trees resulting in irregular canopy gaps. <clears throat> and we see a mosaic of younger trees developing. <coughs> Sorry. Um, now that we looked at the theory behind woodland development, let's see what happens to soil structure. Next, please. So uh, an important um, component of soil structure is uh, soil aggregation. This is a complex process that involves the binding of soil particles into clumps or aggregates. Um, these aggregates um, create pore spaces that allow the water movement, uh, aeration, and uh, the growth of plant roots. Uh, and the formation of aggregates is influenced by a variety of physical, uh, chemical, and also biological uh, factors, including um, soil microbes, um, organic matter, and the movement of water. And the maintenance of a healthy soil aggregation is vital uh, uh, for sustaining soil fertility and supporting healthy plant growth. Next, please. So on the right of this slide, we see an aggregate that was several times uh, magnified, and this is a large macro aggregate. And uh, large macro aggregates are composed of smaller units, uh, which are formed from even smaller aggregates. Next, please. Uh, so imagine um, Russian dolls, uh, a set of dolls of decreasing sizes. 
each fitting inside a larger one. Next, please. The aggregate separation um, into uh, different size classes based on their diameter uh, can be done by submerging water, um, soil in water. Uh, the water increases the pressure inside the aggregates, separating them into soil particles of various size uh, fractions. <clears throat> and so that's why we call them the water stable aggregates. These are the most common size classes for soil aggregates. Next, please. We have large macro aggregates. Next. Small macro aggregates. Next micro aggregates and finally next one uh, we end up also with a, a small fraction of silt and clay um, i have to say that besides the obvious um, difference in size uh, macro aggregates and micro aggregates are also different in terms of uh, their stability composition and functional roles within the uh, soil ecosystem Next, please. <clears throat> so let's look at some of the results. Next one, please. Um, so th this slide shows soil organic carbon stocks on the y-axis. And uh, soil organic carbon stocks is a range in the soil profile uh, with organic layer in pinkish, um, followed by two mineral layers up to a depth of uh, 30 centimeters. We found that generally soil organic carbon stocks uh, uh, increases as forests develop. Uh, specifically, old growth woodland uh, contains more um, soil organic carbon than pasture and the other secondary uh, woodland. Um, curiously, we also found a drop in soil organic carbon in the um, region of the 31 to 80 years uh, woodland group. Uh, which has significantly less uh, soil organic carbon uh, than the other um, uh, woodland groups. Uh, the, and this is the stem exclusion uh, stage, and it corresponds to an active stage in the forest productivity. Uh, next, please. And next one. Yeah. Um, so, I think what's happening in the stem exclusion stage um, is that in nutrient rich soils, uh, such as the ones in our chrono sequence, trees tend to uh, transfer less carbon below ground to their roots uh, because resources such as water and nutrients are wildly available uh, to meet their growth needs. And this leads to a decrease in the direct carbon input to soils compared to the other stages of woodland development. And this might be a possible explanation for what we are seeing here. However, on average, uh, looking only at the mineral layers, uh, secondary woodlands up to 160 years of age held 5% uh, uh, more soil organic carbon than pasture, while old growth woodland uh, uh, held 22% more. Next, please. And next one. So uh, th this graph shows uh, total carbon within the different aggregate size classes from large macro aggregates in pink uh, to the smallest units of silt and clay in gray color. So we found some uh, interesting results for woodland. Um, the overall trend was a reduction in carbon concentration from uh, macro aggregates to micro aggregates. Um, when compared to pasture, the carbon in the microaggregates uh, of the 31 to 80 and the 81 to 160 year group um, was almost double. Uh, next one. As you can see, those arrows pointing to the microaggregates. Next one. Uh, and this is remarkable because the the 81 to 160 year group 
um, has uh, fewer microaggregates than pasture, but has almost double the amount of carbon in them. So, in general, woodlands showed a higher uh, carbon concentration also in the silt and clay fraction, the, the gray color, uh, particularly again in this uh, 81 to 160 years uh, group. Uh, next one, please. Uh, which showed an increase um, in uh, uh, next one uh, in carbon in this uh, silt and clay fraction of 72 per, uh, 72 increase in relation to uh, pasture, which is another uh, outstanding uh, finding in my opinion. Next one. Finally, uh, carbon concentration displayed a very even, uh, almost flat. Um, distribution uh, among aggregate size classes in this uh, stem exclusion stage um, across both uh, mineral uh, layers. Um, yeah, so uh, collectively, I uh, this data shows the significant uh, role of woodland age in enhancing. Um, uh, soil carbon sequestration. Uh, so this the, the pronounced increase of carbon storage within uh, microaggregates in older woodlands, despite lower quantity of, of such aggregates, underscores the e efficiency uh, of these ecosystems um, in uh, their role of um, capturing carbon. Next one, please. Oh yeah. So, so to conclude, um, I uh, investigating the long-term effects of woodland creation on soil structure and the fate of carbon. Uh, this is what I found. Um, next one, please. Um, woodland creation in lowland agricultural landscapes um, increases uh, soil organic carbon stocks. Uh, next one. Uh, for uh, woodland, the overall trend was a reduction in carbon concentration from macroaggregates to microaggregates. Um, the 81 to 160 year old group uh, have uh, fewer microaggregates uh, than pasture, but higher concentrations of carbon. Next one. And uh, woodland also have more, 72% uh, more uh, carbon in the <clears throat> silt and clay fractions uh, than pasture. Next one. Yeah, so, uh, th so these findings um, emphasize the crucial role of woodlands in carbon sequestration and uh, um, soil quality improvement. Um, reinforcing this initial idea of planting for the future. Um, so th these findings can inform uh, sustainable land management practices um, and the strategic development of woodland areas for optimal um, carbon sequestration and uh, environmental uh, conservation. Next one. So I would, I would just like to um, thank uh, my supervisors and also um, all of those that helped me with uh, field lab work and general advice throughout uh, my PhD and this project in particular. Thanks very much and I look forward to your questions. Thanks very much, um, Olivia. Great presentation. Uh, absolutely fascinating. And um, um, I'm sure there'll be loads of questions coming in. So just to nudge people to pop those um, into the questions box so we have a chance um, to be able to ask them before before the end. Great. And we'd like to just welcome back um, Sarah as well and uh, Olivia on audio. It's a shame we can't see you, but um, some uh, Thank you very much, both of you, for um, stay on stay online, Olivia. We, we will do the questions now. Okay. So um, I'll uh, do a couple. Of, I think there for Sarah. There's some questions coming in for you as well. Um, 
thanks for everybody that's put there's there's lots to choose from so i'm just going to pluck a few so sorry i can't get through all of them in the time so um, there's some um, a question for sarah about um about nep and an interesting question actually about whether have there been any negative consequences of the rewilding on the soils that have been observed at nep that you know about <laughs> I, that is interesting um so one of one of the things um my my gut feel is to say no but it probably depends what you mean by negative consequences <laughs> um, i don't know if you've got time to define the, all of that but yeah I was say, um clearly with the animals moving around that has to introduce an element of compaction um and i don't have the data on that we actually su suspect that um compaction is less than than it would have been when they were farmed um however the the structure of the farm is still in place so for animals to move from one field to another they can bust through the hedgehog row if they choose it's their choice but equally they can go through what was an old gateway so you do still have those areas where traffic is more focused um than others mm. my other with, without knowing exactly what um the negative consequence might be it's hard to say they are richer healthier um more dynamic places than they were yeah. when they were being farmed that's for sure I guess it depends on yeah what what you're measuring really I, I mean looking at those pictures that you showed particularly um of the sort of ponding and things that clearly that I guess there has been some compaction of the from the from the livestock there maybe uh, particularly with the pigs I guess but there it's in small areas isn't it so I guess it, it's again um weighing up over the over the whole estate then those those positive and and potentially potentially some of those negative impacts there yeah just possibly one thing i should have brought out um is that we actually look at the ratios of animals quite carefully in the impact that they're having mm -hmm. on the land and the pictures you've seen is from 1100 acres and there are um five pigs this year okay because each of them will rootle 40 to 60 acres so clearly understanding the impact that the animals have um and there's various people involved in a panel who will decide what that ratio is year yeah. year to year that's well, it's good to see this sort of yeah, dynamic management of that yeah great thank you oh, sarah very much, very yeah much so um olivia uh we've got a question uh that's come in uh for you as well um did you find any differences in the soil bulk density between the different ages of the woodlands? Um, yeah, I don't have th those figures uh, present here, but uh, I did find, um, a, if I remember from memory, I found a difference in the bulk density between the youngest uh, uh, woodlands and uh, the mature woodlands, yes. Uh, which uh, makes sense because um the the, the woodland to to create that woodland uh, there was a lot of disturbance in, initially and uh, the use yeah. of machinery so th there was more compaction uh, um in the younger woodlands in relation to more mature woodlands yeah yeah and that ties in with the carbon content as well obviously yeah too so yeah yeah yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, great thank you um, and another question uh, for Sarah was actually two questions that I'm going to schmoosh into one, but um, it's about the carbon sequestration measurements. I think that you you showed there that um, that have been measured across NEP. So one are they published and available, and two um, are there plans to estimate the sequestration in various different habitats across the NEP estates? I think you just showed an overall headline value that the, of the overall um, sequestration compared to the neighbours, but uh, are you are you're looking at sort of the granularity of that for the different sorts of habitats? It's of the, the way the data was collected, um, that, that granularity is there. Um, but to my knowledge, there aren't any plans to, to publish it as such. Um, it's more um, so, so, sort of be, being held to, to inform future, future management decisions. Um, does that answer both? Yeah, 
I think so. Yeah, and it, I seems. guess in terms of is there is there an open like publication of the data? Or is there any plans for people you know for people to be able to view that? Do you know? Do you know? Or I I don't know is is the easy answer to that, um, which I pre appreciate isn't great. What we there is a lot of data and a lot of papers put on the website, and it is something that I will go back and ask. Um, okay. I think in terms of supporting that that knowledge and input you know it's certainly something we could be thinking about yeah yeah definitely I mean I think it'd be interesting you know to you know I, either that gets published I guess by the academics that you've been working with through the various projects or through NEP itself it'd be quite a nice thing for for them to have on the website I think for people to look at um, yeah, great. A, I think so, going forward, that's yeah, it is information they are using to inform current decisions. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Good. Um, and actually, Olivia, I've got a question for you. Uh, it was really interesting to see um, some of your conclusions there. So, looking at those um, microaggregates in the in the woodland at 80 to 160 years, that you have actually fewer of them compared to pasture, but much greater carbon stored in them. And I just wondered whether you had an idea about what the what the reasons behind that was, or what the sort of mechanisms behind that um, finding. Have you have you managed to look into that yet in your PhD? Uh, no, um, it's very interesting, but it, and but it's looking at the literature. The literature doesn't tell me anything about because um, each study is different and. Uh, some studies show that uh, there's a reduction in microaggregates in mature woodlands, but the mechanisms involved uh, is still a mystery. Mm. Um, what's interesting is that this, uh, even with fewer microaggregates, it manages to uh, store uh, more carbon, which shows that mature woodlands are more efficient. Um, than the uh, younger woodlands, which is interesting, but uh, yeah, it, it's something to, to to investigate for sure. Yeah, it's probably a whole nother PhD to be honest. Yes, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's really that's really interesting. Um, and then uh, I'll just come back for, uh, just for we've got time for just one more question. I think um, for for Sarah, um, this is always a kind of interesting. Uh, uh, debate between um, ruminants and things like greenhouse gas emissions and things like this, you know, that's quite a hot topic. So is there, is there any monitoring at NEP being done on the methane production from the herbivores, from the ruminants and the browsing on the, on the vegetation compared with, let's say, a more intensive grassland. I'm not sure what your what the neighbours farm it actually is. So uh, you know, are there any um, um, comparisons then bet between some of those emissions that are coming from the, so the activity of the livestock? There, there certainly is a university at the moment that has flux towers and such across the estate, and this is what they are monitoring. But I probably shouldn't steal their thunder or their, <laughs> <laughs> their, credit, um, their, their credit for the work they're doing. But, but yes, that is being monitored across the estate at the moment. It's a, okay. you know, it's a really interesting point. Yeah, exactly. What, well, yeah, watch this space. So we exactly yes, don't want to sorry, that's a <laughs> drop a spoiler in the end of the um, <laughs> webinar for the for these different things. But I mean, it's fascinating. It's such an interesting sort of system that 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 is operating there. That you know, that there's there's so many different angles to look at the all of those kind of ecosystem services in the round, really. So um, yeah, that's great. Most definitely. Okay. Um, I'm going to, as we were over one o'clock, we could probably go on for half the rest of the afternoon um, asking questions. Um, but I'd uh, just like to thank both of our presenters for two absolutely fascinating talks today. It's been really uh, exciting uh, talking to you both. And we look forward to seeing all of those sort of outputs from the activities, both at NEP and also in your Woodland Creation Project as well, Olivia. Um, so I'd like to officially, from on behalf of the Society, you know, thank both uh, Sarah, George uh, and, and Olivia for coming along to present today. Um, and extend that also to the audience as well. So thanks very much. We've had lots of you watching um, live uh, this lunchtime. Uh, you'll find a quick 
feedback survey when you leave the webinar. So please do just, just take um, a couple of minutes to, to complete that. That information is really valuable to us uh, to plan the next um, uh, webinars and sessions. Um, and just to remind you that the next Zoom into Soil is, is next month. We try to do one once a month and the date has been set for that already. That's on Wednesday, the 3rd of April. And this is about something completely different. So it's thinking about uh, contaminated soils and the impact on human health. So it'd be another really interesting angle discussing this very hot topic in, in soil science. Um, as I mentioned before at the beginning, the recording from this webinar will be available on our YouTube channel so you can watch it to your heart's content again. And if you missed any important things, you, you can catch up on that on the, on the YouTube. All of our other Zoom Into Soil webinars are also available there as well. So if you're interested in some of the other topics, please do dip into our YouTube channel to have a look. And uh, without further ado, um, I hope to see you at the next one and at any future events that the British Society of Soil Science are hosting. Uh, thanks again and goodbye.